Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about anything that has to do about the Beatles. It could be about their music, their group years, their solo years, their history, anything going on in the news. It's an all-encompassing show about the Fab Four. I'm Ken Michaels, and I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show, and I hope that you know me for a few of my other Beatles radio programs, a syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, and also another podcast show, a talk show podcast on the solo Beatles called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And I'm being joined by my two other regulars in the show. First of all, a man that you've known if you've uh, listened to the radio in the New York area for the past 35 years, where he's been a fixture at New York's WFUV. He is their Beatle guy at the station. He's done a ton of interviews, great interviews at the station, and Beatle specials there, too. And even recently, uh, a few specials on the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. And that's Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hey, everyone. How you doing? And our other co-host has been with us for much longer in the show. Uh, he's been with us for many, many years now, and he is... Uh, the author of several Beatle books, including The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and also Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. He also was the writer in the classical department at the New York Times, and he currently freelances for the Wall Street Journal, Beatle Fan, lots of other publications, and that is Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken, and hello, everyone. On the show this time out... Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, solo Beatle albums that we appreciate more now than when they first were released. And each of us will handpick an album that we've chosen and we'll discuss why we like those albums more today than we did when they first came out. But as usual, we have a lot of news to get to. Actually, this is our first show in three weeks, so a lot has accumulated. I'll try to condense it as best I can here. Uh, first of all, let's talk about Ringo Starr, who wrapped up a final concert for his latest of his dates for the All-Star Band, who just celebrated their 30th anniversary since their very first concert, which happened to be September 3rd, 1989. And the last concert was September 1st, 2019, which took place at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles. It was strongly rumored that Paul McCartney might show up to join the celebration, but he was a no-show. However, several all-stars of the past came on stage at the finale for when Ringo sings with a little help from my friends. And they were Joe Walsh and Nils Lochran. Both of them were in the very first all-star band. Richard Page from Mr. Mister, Jim Keltner, Edgar Winter, and Eric Carmen. Very nice to see all of them joining Ringo at the end of that concert. Any of you see the video for that online? I uh, did not. Nor did, no, nor did I, but I've seen it there. I just haven't, uh, I, I didn't click play. Uh, it's fun to watch because um, we always bring up the fact that Ringo is so full of energy uh, during the show, and at the very end he does jumping jacks. Well, <laughs> Ringo and Joe Walsh together did jumping jacks. Oh, uh, wow. during, with, yeah, just for that alone, it's worth watching. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just nice to see all the other all-stars there on stage. Um, Eric Carmen was on a higher level than everybody else singing into the microphone. And it was nice to see all the others kind of hovered over the same microphone. It's really nice to see all those different members uh, joining Ringo on stage. Uh, Paul McCartney's new children's book, Hey Grand Dude, was just released on September 5th, available on hardback, CD, and also as uh, an audiobook narrated by Paul, who made an appearance at the Calderstones bookstore in Piccadilly and read from the book to a small group of children from Brixton's primary school and to a few dozen people who got a ticket for this exclusive event. Paul's living room was recreated for the event while uh, Paul sat in a comfy chair and read. <laughs> I know that both of you are just, you know, really sorry you missed out on that. Now I'm just picturing Paul drinking from a sippy cup while he's doing it. But uh, <laughs> sorry. that's also, the child in me coming out. 
Also on the McCartney front, there's another book of Linda McCartney photos coming from Linda. It's called Linda McCartney, The Polaroid Diaries. These are intimate and personal photos taken by Linda, mainly of the family, of Paul and their kids, of them dancing, eating, horse riding, and many moments of their everyday life on their farm in Scotland. There are interspersed portraits, still lifes, and interior compositions, plus landscapes across Scotland and Arizona, and lots of photos that show her love of animals, of cats, hens, lambs, and horses. And this will be available in a collector's edition and in two limited art editions, each with a print numbered and signed by Paul McCartney. Uh, the book is 232 pages, and it's due out November 18th from Passion Books. I know that uh, Alan is saving up for that right now. Uh, yes, that's already... Uh... It's already. Uh, but speaking of, um, by the way, it, for collectors out there, um, you're going to have to get not only Paul's book of Hey Grand Dude, but since he is voicing the audiobook, you have to get that too, because that now is an actual Paul McCartney recording. That's true. But yes, I I'll get the Linda book too. <laughs> yeah. Also, Paul revealed some upsetting news that one of his grandsons was mugged at Knife Point in London and stole his phone. His grandson was upset that he didn't fight with the man, and Paul told him, no, he did the right thing since he had a knife. The documentary Echo in the Canyon will have a DVD release of September the 16th. That's coming up right around the corner next Monday. Ringo Starr is among the musicians interviewed for this look at the music of the mid to late 60s coming out of Laurel Canyon and how artists like the Beach Boys, Birds, Mamas and Papas and Buffalo Springfield influenced other artists on the music scene. It was said to have Tom Petty's last interview and other notable musicians interviewed include Eric Clapton and Jackson Brown. It also features artists today covering music from that period, including Jacob Dylan, Beck, Regina Spector, Fiona Apple, Nora Jones, and Cat Power. I haven't seen this documentary yet, but now that it's coming out on DVD, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it, too. I haven't seen it either, although I've heard the soundtrack album, uh, which is basically Jacob Dylan. Mm, how is it? Eh. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's harmless. It's it's just Jacob Dylan covering, uh, you know these these classic songs with special guests. I did, you know, eh. harmless. I like that as a reviewing term. I might adopt it. <laughs> eh. There's nothing wrong with it, but once John Rockwell reviewed a concert and, and and the best he could come up with was it was not offensive. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, speaking of documentaries, there's a new one called The Cavern Club, The Beat Goes On, which will be premiering on the Sky Arch Channel this Saturday, September 14th. It tells the entire history of the club, described as the cradle of British pop music. The Cavern Club's website says they have played a pivotal role in each and every period of popular music since it first opened its doors as a jazz venue in 1957, the Beatles played there 292 times between February 1961 and August 1963. And in all these years, the club has embraced the ever-changing music scene. And it includes appearances from the Beatles, Paul McCartney, the Rolling Stones, The Who, Stevie Wonder, Elton John, Queen, Adele, Rod Stewart, Steve Van Zandt, and others. Either of you heard about this documentary? No, but when they when they say they um, you know have always embraced the you know n the changing musical styles, it's it's not really true. As we know that uh, when it was jazz club, when the Beatles began playing there, and they used to get notes passed to them on the stage saying, "Stop playing that rock and roll," you know. Mm. So, well, maybe since change. then they. <laughs> Hmm. But they, they learned their lesson from the Beatles. Well, yeah, you know. <laughs> By now. Mm -hmm. uh, along with the October issue of the British music magazine Mojo, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' Abbey Road album, is another British magazine called Long Live Vinyl, which has a review of the new deluxe edition for Abbey Road. And that is coming out September 
the 27th. Cheryl Crow has a new album out. It's called Threads. And it's a combination of new compositions from her and some cover versions from artists she admires, one of which happens to be George Harrison. And she covers Beware of Darkness on the new album. Cheryl's version also has Eric Clapton, Sting, and Brandy Carlisle playing on it. Okay? Mm -hmm. Danny Harrison has now done quite a lot of work scoring music for films. Along with his partner from his band, The New Number Two, Paul Hicks, uh, the two of them have scored the music for Beautiful Creatures and Learning to Drive, the title song for the recent Netflix series, Dogs, also the recent four-part HBO series, The Case Against Adnan Syed, and now the new Netflix docuseries about Microsoft founder Bill Gates. It's called Inside Bill's Brain, Decoding Bill Gates. It's a three-part series, and it premieres on September the 20th. So Danny Harrison certainly carving out a name for himself with film scores. Some reminders of new releases coming out. The new documentary, John and Yoko, Above Us Only Sky, coming out on DVD, Blu-ray, and digitally. That's September the 13th, this Friday. The film Yesterday, coming out uh, on DVD, Blu-ray, and digital, September 24th. Ringo's second book of photographs called Another Day in the Life. That comes out September 24th as well. And, of course, the Abbey Road Deluxe box box set for the 50th anniversary of that album, September 27th. A lot of things coming out this month. More money. <laughs> and also, it was 50 years ago today. That tour starts on September the 21st in Atlantic City. And that has Todd Rundgren, Mickey Dolenz, Christopher Cross, Joey Mullen, and Jason Sheff saluting the Beatles' White Album. And they're not doing the entire White Album, I've heard, but many of the songs from the White Album. It's half their own hits, the other half White Album material. Speaking of Joey Molland, he is working on a new album with Mark Hudson and Mario McNulty, known for working with David Bowie and Julian Lennon. And so the two of them are producing this new album from Joey Molland, and he has uh, started a Kickstarter campaign to cover the cost of production, if you're interested in helping Joey out, you can go to kickstarter.com. Okay, so right now, why don't we talk about uh, a special event that Darren was a part of a few weeks ago because he got to go to a listening session for the new uh, box set for Abbey Road. Darren? Yeah, um, and they... Um, Universal um, has conducted these media events for these reissues, uh, starting with uh, Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band a couple of years ago, uh, last year the White Album, and now with the anniversary uh, reissue of Abbey Road coming, Universal did the same thing, calling together members of the media to listen to selections from the deluxe edition of the anniversary issue. Uh, so um, I found out about I know we uh, Ken and I were both at uh, the White Album session, uh, that took place last year. Uh, I was not at Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band and was thrilled to be able to be at the Abbey Road one on uh, Tuesday, August 20th. Uh, they held it in New York. They held several of them in New York City. I think they were all at Dolby Laboratories on Avenue of the Americas. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, Giles Martin, who, of course, we all know is the mastermind behind these anniversary reissues whether they be whether he oversees the remixing or the uh the surround sound mixes and all that giles martin is the head honcho um for these um these reissues uh and has been at these listening sessions and conducted these sessions in the past giles was not at the abbey road session i'm sorry to say because he suffered a torn achilles tendon playing tennis i think Maybe sometime I'm going to I think they told me sometime in June it happened or July, maybe. So he was unable to come to fly and to come uh, to and conduct these sessions. So uh, this um, listening session was conducted by a guy from Universal. His name is Guy Hayden, who uh, instead started things off by showing a video greeting from Giles Martin explaining, sorry, I couldn't be there, but 
give this stuff a listen. This is the 50th anniversary of Abbey Road, that kind of simple video greeting. And uh, then they started with the new 2019 mix of Abbey Road, uh, which Giles Martin did. And this is a, a remix of the original album. And they proceeded to play Come Together, Something, Here Comes the Sun, Because You Never Give Me Your Money. I'm reading off side two. That's because they played all of side two. I should have just put here all of side two. So they did Come Together and Something and then flipped over and played the entire second side. And you're in this, you know, you're in this Dolby laboratory, this Dolby studio. So it's all state of the art. There are, you know, several hundred speakers surrounding you. Um, <laughs> you're sitting on a speaker. I mean, they're everywhere. And so the sound is incredible. I felt, and I'd be curious when it's come, when we all have heard it, we all have it, and we review it and talk about it, if the two of you agree with me. The White Album, there were lots of sonic differences, subtle, maybe some obvious, some very subtle that you heard in the new remix as opposed to the original from 1968, mm -hmm. right? There was many songs you could, oh, this sounded different, or this was mixed louder, or I didn't know they had a piano in here, but you could hear it in the mix, a remix, right? right? You'll agree that there were a considerable number of them on the White Album. Right, quite mm. a lot. Yeah, there aren't, to my ears, there aren't all that many with Abbey Road. Uh, and that could be because they're, you know, the initial recording was maybe done better uh, for whatever reason. I didn't detect as many. Now, on Come Together, I made a point to say the guitars on Come Together really did pop and jump out of the speakers. And the fade out towards the very end, the vocal fade was a bit different. Uh, whether or not the fade out maybe was done slower, so you're hearing a little more of uh, the vocal before that disappears completely. But I did detect a different, slightly different vocal fade on Come Together. They then played something, and the middle section was very bright. These were the differences I was hearing. More of um, the instrumentation coming out a little more, as opposed to hearing things that, I didn't, that you didn't hear on the original. Flipped over to side two, they played Here Comes the Sun. Again, my notes here. Vocals are very bright, and you hear uh, the vocal, the little darling part, multi-track very clearly. There's also a synthesizer that we've all heard that's playing what sounds like a bit of a flute part. That's very bright, and you actually hear little subtle notes that were there, but we didn't pick up on in the past. Mm. So, And that's all, you know, that's the... Um, and I'm not going to hum the, med the melody because it'll make everyone ill. But towards <laughs> the end, there's like a high pitched, what sounds like a flute. It's the synth. And there's a little more of it to hear now with this new remix. But again, the impression was it was there all along. It's just been sort of buried uh, on past mixes. Uh, because was next. And of course, the vocals explode on this new 20, 2019 mix. You never give me your money. I, I wrote down, uh, you hear additional guitar during the fade. And I did not make any individual notes for any of the remainder of uh, the album. Sun King drew to Her Majesty. So there wasn't anything that jumped out at me except it sounded great. Mm. And then I they j joked after the fact, I'm sorry, they joked after the fact that Giles Martin swear that the length of silence between the end and Her Majesty is exactly as it was on the original album as it is in this 2019 remix and everyone got to chuckle over that mm -hmm. uh what well, who's gonna ask the question i was just gonna say that universal um sent out emails and a press release where they let you hear the new remix for something and i got to hear it it was shared on facebook all over the place so um so you know for my of the darling yeah yeah well, darling's more recent but did you hear the orchestral track of something? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Because uh, they did get to that next. They went to uh, the next portion. If you remember how the White Album was structured, you had the original album, but the new mix. Uh, and then the next section were, were the outtakes. Uh, the, uh, and and uh, Guy Hayden 
discussed briefly how they really spent a lot of time trying to define these as outtakes or sessions. The result is they are referred to as sessions. They're not out. I don't remember his reasoning, but they spent a considerable amount of time debating if the unreleased, you know, alternate take should be referred to as outtakes or sessions. They're sessions, by the way. So and then they proceeded to play, uh, starting off with um, I Want You, She So Heavy. Now, I don't know if you read this. I did read this going into the session. I had heard this already. This was the take that they were doing. Evidently, the soundproofing of the building of Abbey Road is, I guess, flawed. And it was a late night session. You know, the Beatles did a lot of the middle of the night sessions. And they were evidently so loud when recording I Want You, She So Heavy that complaints were coming from outside to turn it down. And you hear, as they're about to go into another take of I Want You, She So Heavy, you hear, might have been Glenn Johns, but don't hold me to that. You do hear someone from the control room talk down to the band uh, down on the floor that we've been asked to turn it down. We're being loud. And they all kind of reacted. They were a little taken back. And you might think they were like, oh, oh you know, uh, tell whoever's outside, I'm the, we're the Beatles. Screw you. would expect that kind of response. John's reaction was more along the lines of, and you'll hear all of this because this is included on the sessions disc. You'll hear him pass a comment. All right, let's do it one more time loud. Uh, and then maybe we could quiet it down a bit and, you know, approach the song in a different light. Well, that's very interesting. And then they went into this particular take of I Want You, She's So Heavy that I, might have then been morphed into the conclusion that has Billy Preston's organ all over it. Remember on Love? You hear Billy Preston's mad organ mm -hmm. uh, in the Love mix. Now you're hearing it throughout the entire second half of I Want You, She's So Heavy. And it's pr some pretty wild stuff that he was playing that got mixed out and it doesn't fade, of course edit or a fade or anything or it just kind of breaks down in the studio uh the version so that was very interesting hmm. they then played uh, goodbye mccartney acoustic demo of goodbye which we've heard on bootlegs right. um but it sounded in this in this situation it sounded like it was paul doing a tune that made the album you know what i'm saying um, it was a very plain, very white album like acoustic demo of Goodbye, which Paul gave to Mary Hopkin. Uh, next up was Old Brown Shoe, an early take. I put it sounded like it was an early take. George's vocal was very clear. So you can uh, kind of understand the vocal, the lyrics a little better than the finished version of Old Brown Shoe, which, you know, you don't think of it. But, yeah, it was recorded during the Abbey Road sessions. Uh, then we then they played Octopus's Garden again, an early take uh, that had a, a mistake in it and the take broke down and they did it again. And then they concluded with the orchestral uh, take of uh, something, the orchestral track that we've heard when the announcement was made on, on Facebook and whatnot. And this album is going to be done in and and I don't pretend to understand this totally, but this would probably appeal to you, Alan. There's going to be a Dolby Atmos mix of Abbey Road mm -hmm. included in the box set. Please don't ask. I guess it's <laughs> don't ask five me. <laughs> point, five five point one times two, maybe. I don't know. All I know is that there were speakers on the ceiling that were kind of clicked on. Hmm. I was a, I was a little underwhelmed by it because I was expecting to see God, <laughs> thinking, my goodness, all these speakers are going to be, you know, and it wasn't. It was it was fabulous, but it you know it was like, okay, that was interesting. I didn't get that much out of it. I didn't pretend to understand totally about Dolby Atmos, which is the next, I guess, the next, the next big thing after five point one. Uh, all I th kept thinking about is if I go home and tell my wife that I have to add a dozen more speakers to the stereo system, that's the end of the marriage. <laughs> um, but they played uh, the Dolby Atmos mix of Here Comes the Sun because Golden Slumbers carry that weight and the end. And with that, they threw us all out. Uh, and that was the end of the session. Hmm. 
There so. was no Q and A. Yeah, there was a little bit of a Q and A. Nothing really, you know, nothing really that earth shattering, you know, information wise. I think that the fact that uh, Guy Hayden was conducting it, but the guy who was actually sitting in doing the work over these months wasn't there, Giles Martin. So the questions, you know, I asked the question about. I've always been intrigued with the physical master tapes. How many are there? Where are they? And while I'm, we're listening to this, I'm thinking, he's not going to tell me where they are. So I won't be stupid and ask because they're probably, they are, I'm sure, I'm positive now, come to think of it, some hidden secret location. But I was curious about how many takes are we talking here? You know, reel to reels that are playing at like 15, I guess they're playing at like 15 IPS. So all of these sessions, it's got to be dozens upon dozens of reels of tapes that had to be listened to from beginning to end. And I think they did listen to every single tape, even if the tape was blank, because remember, they discovered that version of Juliet edited onto the end of a reel. So and it wasn't marked on the tape box. No one knew it was there. So I think, you know, they sat there and listened to everything. And I'm thinking, wow, that's got to be some undertaking because who knows how many reels you're talking about here. You, you know, it's one album. It's not five reels, folks. It's probably five reels per song. You can you know, actually get think. this information by getting um, John C. Wynn's Lifting Latches, which lists all of the tapes, their EMI um, uh, filing numbers, and their contents. Wow. I, I don't I'm know what hand it hand it hmm? I'm writing it down now because I've always been very uh, interested in the physical aspect of not only the Beatles, but other artists. And of course, now with the news of what happened with Universal a decade ago in California, with tapes being oh, destroyed God. by massive yeah. fire, yeah. the concept, if you just stop and think about it, that is an astonishing story. And the, I mean, you're talking about. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, of reels of tape and other medium that were destroyed. Right. You know, God, what that must have smelled like. Anyway, um, <laughs> so that was it. And I think my, my takeaway was it will all be knocked out by Abbey Road, but Abbey Road is going to maybe disappoint someone put up against the White Album because there was just so much more there with the White Album that Abbey Road... You can't, you know, couldn't, can't hold up to it. You know, you know what I'm saying? You know, Abby, yeah. Matt White Album had so much to listen to, discover, and and, and 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 so many songs to begin with that Abbey Road has a strike against it, uh, and that's no fault of, you know, the albums. But I, can't, I would find it hard for somebody to complain once it's out and they've heard it. Mm -hmm. Right. The Good. original release, it's kind of like the packaging of the White Album. When you bought it in 1968 and then when Abbey Road came out and if you were expecting to get all kinds of, you know, you didn't even get anything on the inner sleeve. You got nothing, no posters, you know, so maybe there was a bit of a letdown on the packaging, but still the album was like glorious. The release of the box set of Abbey Road is going to probably have that same, you're going to have that same reaction. The White Album was like, oh, uh, and Sergeant Pepper, the mystique of it being Sergeant Pepper, Abbey Road is going to maybe disappoint some. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. From those few tracks that leaked out, I was kind of impressed. I know this is what Ringo has said, but you, I think you definitely hear the bass and the drums more mm -hmm. on something like something and, and Oh Darling um, on the new remix. But yeah, when you compare everything to the White Album with three discs of outtakes plus the demos, I mean, you can't beat that. <laughs> right. Yeah, but, it was uh, hard. I know. How did they distinguish between what is an outtake and what is a session? There was a reason that they gave, and it was kind of a, a funny, it was a little bit of a lighthearted part of the discussion on the, you know, and we're talking about Giles Martin and his team, you know, I guess meetings at Abbey Road over the minute details of the packaging and what should we call this or what should we call that. And, and outtake, an outtake in their mind had a perceived maybe connotation if i remember that it was no good in the first place i think uh, I, I think the difference probably is because of the way they were recorded so an outtake would be 
you know, like uh, if you play a song start to finish and you decide you don't like it, or even if you don't finish, you know, there's a breakdown or whatever, you don't use that take at all. That's an outtake. But a session, yeah, yeah. I think you might find that certain elements within the, what we use to call an outtake, are actually the same elements as on the finished mix, but you're hearing it with maybe a vocal track that wasn't used and... You know, exactly. So, yeah. Mm. You know, and the White Album had also genuine outtakes like Not Guilty, yeah. for example. And other than McCartney's demo of Goodbye, there isn't anything like that. In fact, he even said um, in the presentation that nothing is unreal. There's nothing out there unreleased that we haven't heard. Abbey Road is what we know. And that's what's on the tapes. And there was no fighting or anything. They were very conscious, I guess of when the tapes were rolling of working on the songs and that's all that was there. But also since you mentioned, um, old Brown shoe, we also have the ballad of John and Yoko in here on the box set. So right. that's included too. I guess though, but those came out not on the album, but they came right. out as opposed to maybe not guilty. And what's the new Mary Jane, which I guess technically are outtakes and there's none of that. So therefore the uh, disc is referred to as sessions. Hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you for that report, Darren. All right. I was thrilled um, to be there. And uh, I'm looking forward to this. I'm always excited anytime any of these products come out. Anytime you learn anything new about the Beatles, you know, I'm all for that. When I heard the um, just the orchestration for something, which to me is absolutely stunning, it makes you really appreciate the work that George Martin did there because I think it's so understated. Sometimes you don't really pay attention to the orchestration on something. You're so wrapped in the song itself, you know, and everything that the band brought to it that you may not hear the orchestration as much. And when you hear some of the stuff, especially that's buried in the mix, it makes you appreciate even more all the work that George Martin put into it. And kind of like when the Imagine box set came out and they had all the, the separate orchestration for songs like Imagine and How Do You Sleep and How, and you hear that separate from everything else, you appreciate more of the work that was put into it. So I really like isolated tracks. You know, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of difficult to program on the radio, but <laughs> for listening at home and for studying the music, it really is fascinating. Anyway, before we get to our main topic, I just want to make sure that I mentioned something that I forgot to mention in our last few shows. When we did our 300th episode, I made a comment about the song Here Comes the Sun, which once again was listed as the most streamed Beatles song on the Internet. And I was questioning why. Because there's so many great Beatles songs. Why that particular one? And we did have a listener who wrote in right after that episode, whose name is John Henninger. I want to thank you, John, for writing in, because uh, I think people might might find this interesting. I think this is probably the reason why. He said, to answer your question about why Here Comes the Sun is always a top current popularity list, it's because of playlists. Most people's streaming consumption is off of curated playlists. On Spotify, for example, there's a popular morning, wake up, face the day type playlist that always has Here Comes the Sun. It's the same reason why Wonderful Christmas Time and Happy Christmas War is Over are at the top of the most popular solo songs every year, not because they're really more liked than other hits, but because they get millions and millions of guaranteed streams by being on every holiday playlist each December. Very astute observation there, I would say. Mm -hmm. Would you guys agree? Mm -hmm. eh. No, I'm just kidding. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, John, once again for writing into us about that. So, our main topic on the show this time out: we're each going to pick a solo Beatle album that we appreciate more now than when they first came out. So, for whatever the reason, there might be certain albums that came out and you weren't impressed by it the first time around, and maybe over the years you've grown to like them more. So, each of us have picked a particular album, and we're each going to say why. You feel the way that we do. Why don't we start with you, Darren? All right. Now, you. Do, how do you want to do this? Do you want me to talk about each of the solo, uh, each one, uh, and then hand it over? Or are we going art, Bob? I, I thought we were only picking one. No, 
No, we're we're only picking one period from any of the Beatles a solo. Just one album. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna cross that out here. Cross this one <laughs> off here. Actually, <laughs> I know what I would pick, but I do have everything. Everyone else. But you know, this way we could expand this and do this again. You know. Okay. In the future. So. I'm thinking. See, that's why. Ken and Alan have been doing these podcasts longer than me because they so they've got it all together up there. Yeah, I actually it, it makes still makes it easy for me to pick the album I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, choose the one that I appreciate more now than when it first came out is it was easy for me and that's McCartney too. Uh, set the scene here. It's 1980. It's the spring, and 15 year old Darren DeVivo has his copy of his new Paul McCartney album that he bought on a Saturday at. I think it was a Corvette type store. Very excited. Runs home. And he used to be able to run at one point in his life, unlike now. Uh, and I bring my McCartney 2 album home, and it has the seven inch single bonus single of Coming Up. I don't totally get the concept of Coming Up. There's two different versions, but we're about to figure that out now. And he spends the next 35 to 40 minutes listening to it. And when it ends, he begins to cry a lot. Why? Paul's lost his mind. <laughs> now, I'm 15 years old, and so I didn't get it. I didn't get what was going on here with McCartney, too. You know, it's coming after Back to the Egg, uh, w w which was a rock record and the quote-unquote heaviest thing that McCartney had done up to that point. And I was familiar with all of McCartney's albums. So uh, when McCartney, too, came out, and I thought to myself, you know, I should have known. I remember thinking, that's why the other version of Coming Up that they're not playing as much of on the radio sounds weird. It's just like the rest of this album. What on earth is, and what the heck is bogey music? <laughs> I didn't get it in the context of what was going on. So as years passed, and I learned more, and the internet, of course, and, and publications, well, before the internet, Books would come out and discussions and Beatle Fest conventions and stuff. It's all started to fall into place for me. You know, that, you know, McCartney, too, was something that Paul, you know, was messing around with at home in the summer of 79. And he didn't necessarily set out with the goal of doing an album, but basically just messing around with some machines and some new synths. And he was heard a lot of the new wave music that was being made that were very synthesizer heavy. So, you know, he got the equipment and just basically was messing around in much the same way, I guess, that I used to in the 70s with my, you know, tape recorders. I actually used to play around with tape recorders and do a lot of two virgins like things when I was a kid because it was fun. You know, it was fun to record a fart and play it back at the high speed and then laugh hysterically for half an hour. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> and which I'm laughing at now because I'm still in a way 10 years old in my head, even today. But I, I, I didn't understand what Paul was doing with McCartney, too, back in 79, 80. And now I appreciate, appreciate it much more as being a time capsule of the state of music and McCartney discovering all this new gadgetry that was happening with these new bands that were coming out. And deciding to play around with synthesizers and, and programming and, 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 and messing around with pitch on the vocals and what could be done, you know, by speeding up and slowing down. And, gee, I could make like a whole chorus of different creatures, but like in bogey music, by altering both speeding up and slowing down my vocals. And I get it now. I, I didn't get it when I was 15 years old when it first came out. And so that I can look at McCartney too much differently now and understand what he was after. I like it a lot much. I, I think it's, it's, I think it's, you know, it's got, it's definitely has its flaws, but I, I can enjoy it much now in the context of what he was doing, uh, you know, with the album. And I wonder if McCartney too would have ever come out had Paul not been arrested in Japan in January uh, uh, 1980, and Wings toured Japan and went ahead with their plans to do a lot of touring in 1980, Paul might not have had the time to go back to those tapes and put out and, and basically build the McCartney 2 album from those session tapes 
and put out the album. You know, uh, so my pick is McCartney too. Wow, that's a very interesting point. What you just said there, how things might have changed if Paul wasn't busted. I mean, Alan probably could could elaborate more. I mean, I read and I don't remember where, and it was a long time ago that when he got arrested, Paul just wanted to go home, and I don't blame him. He had spent ten days away from his family. He was in jail. You just want to go home, you know what I mean, and just close the doors and pull the shades. And I guess that's when he decided, oh, yeah, all that stuff I recorded last summer. Let's listen back to it. And McCartney, too, came from Matt. If Paul wasn't home with a lot of downtime, if they were going ahead with their plans of touring the U.S., would McCartney, too, have ever happened? Well, Wings could have got together and and recorded an album together instead of, you know, putting out McCartney too. I mean, if, if that, right. that was a possibility too, they, they, they did actually start work on what became tug of war. So, uh, there was some stuff in the works and, uh, you know, there's the question of if he hadn't been busted, whether wings would have broken up, you know? Right. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's hard to say. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know what I think in a few years when I get to that part. But, you know, I, I, the, my feeling um, based on what I've found so far looking into this is that he was kind of tired of it, of Wings as a, a concept and kind of wanted to go solo. And um, so even though Wings still technically existed and still did some recording after McCartney 2 it kind of was not the same after the Japan bust and uh i think everyone was a little bit disgruntled so and and from Paul's own point of view you know he had done this band for really all of the years. 70s and uh was looking at maybe a way of doing something else and 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 then you have you know by the end of the year you have the um you know tragic business of john being shot which you know also altered his attitude about things like touring and you know how public he wanted to be that kind of thing so yeah it's uh McCartney too is you know it's an important album in a way in his discography. There, a lot of people hate it. I, I've never hated it that much. Um, there are things on it I'm not crazy about, but um, you know coming up. <laughs> but you know I think he's trying to do some interesting things and he's he's exploring some out there ideas and it's you know that what what you say about you know whether he would have put it out is is. A really interesting question because he does a lot of stuff that's just for himself that's not necessarily to be put out and that might have started as one of those but then again mccartney right. one started as one of those it seems yeah. but wouldn't but but he he uh he did he was messing around with the first mccartney album knowing it the beatles are done mm -hmm. at least and at that time there was today we know they broke up they never came back but I don't think that much thought went into it. You know, we're just not working together now. Mm -hmm. I got to do something. So you start recording, you know, it's going to be a solo album. Right. Saying, whereas I always got the impression Paul just messed around with McCartney too. You know, got up in the morning, had some herbal tea and uh, decided, let's see what happens if I sing this song and speed it up. So I sound like a chipmunk, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Yeah. and boy, that's funny. You know, you hear a lot of different reasons as to why Wings ended. And apart from the fact that I happen to agree that I think Paul was getting tired of the band format and the limitations that come with that, and also the fact that the fourth and fifth members kept on leaving until, uh, you know, the more recent lineup. But you do hear about George Martin wanting Paul to make a solo album and not for Tug of War to be a Wings album. So right. it was a combination probably of several things. But I just wanted to ask you when you say you finally got it, McCartney too, are you just mm -hmm. referring to the fact that it really was like a private home recording that he didn't intend on releasing at no, first? No, 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 no. Uh, because when, when it came out in 1980, I mean, I was not, other than being a member of the, Wing, the, the Wings Fun Club uh, and maybe the occasional interview, and, of course, there was that album that came out at roughly that time, which was the audio of the interview for Musician Magazine. 
you know, this was back in the day when there wasn't a lot of information. And I'm 15 years old, so I'm not expecting McCartney or anybody in that, you know, any 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 veteran musician that I like put out something that was so left of center. You know what I'm saying? Mm. That uh, that it would actually throw me and, uh, and and elicit a response that I was that I, I remember crying, thinking, "Holy smoke, this is terrible! What's going on here?" Uh. You know what I mean? Uh, but then, in time, it started to make sense. It started to fall into place. That's what I mean by got it. I understood it. And it I know my opinion and it proved my appreciation for the album. When the album first came out, came out, I immediately loved Temporary Secretary. And I know that a lot of people still to this day detest mm-hmm. that song. And uh, as well as Bogey Music, which I thought was really funny. And it was Paul embracing new wave and, and technology. And uh, I thought it was a fun a fun thing for him to do. Um, uh, yeah, that, Well, that was the right reaction. My reaction was... He's out of his mind, and this is awful. Reinforced, actually, now, come to think of it. Now, what are we, 1980? A few years later, no, 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 no. 1980, that was the, um, I was done with my, yeah, right, okay. I was, I was in between first and second year of high school. So when I arrived in high school in September of 80, it was my second year, and I remember my homeroom teacher was a big Beatles fan. Uh, and, and several months in, several months into the first, the second year of high school, he spotted a picture of Sergeant Pepper that I had inside my locker, and he came up to me. And at first, I thought I was going to get in trouble for hanging a picture in my locker. And he says, "No, I'm a big Beatles fan too. It's nice to see that you're one." And we that made it, you know, a friendship between mm-hmm. me and the homeroom teacher. And I remember him telling me, and his words were, "Oh, McCartney too was just trite." <laughs> and I was like, trite. Okay, you think that? Huh? Let me go get the dictionary and look up trite. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, he doesn't like it. He kind of <laughs> agrees with my opinion of it. I don't get that album. But I, my, like I said, I got older. I learned more. I think, you know, I found out what it, how it was recorded, why it was done. And, uh, and I was like, oh, see, all right. Now it kind of makes sense. He wasn't losing his marbles. In fact, he was being ballsy in putting out something that was left of center. That was very different from the last record he'd put out less than a year earlier. And, um, you know, uh, was was curious about what all these other bands were doing, you know, uh, that were so that were purely synthesizer bands that were playing with a computer as opposed to a guitar or Mm. a keyboard. And, you know, it's kind of ironic. You got so many fans still to this day that don't want someone like McCartney to move on and embrace the new sounds and the new technology of the time. And when McCartney 2 in particular, um, a lot of fans will point to a song like One of These Days and say they prefer that because it's the old Paul. It's Paul with an acoustic guitar or um, Waterfalls, for that matter. You know, a great McCartney ballad as opposed to Temporary Secretary, the studio coming up, bogey music, the instrumentals, that kind of thing. It's still I mean, I, going on to this day, you know? Yeah. I mean, I still listen to a few of the songs on McCartney, too, and I'm not crazy for, to be devil's advocate here, Waterfalls. Because to me, it drags because it's so slow. And lyrically, don't go jumping waterfalls. Stay on the ground. What is he? What do you mean? Who the heck is going to jump a waterfall? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, I thought the same thing about Summer's Day song when it first came out. And now I really like Summer's Day song. And I don't know what it what my ears hear now that didn't hear 30 years ago. So, but enough. I've talked enough. There is other hosts here <laughs> that need to chime in. Shut up, Darren. <laughs> Alan, I believe you're next. Okay, my choice was John Lennon's uh, "Rock and Roll." Um, hey. Yeah, it, it was you know sort of like a, a a hard decision because there were an awful lot of the solo albums that I really didn't like that much when they came out, and I came to like more over the years. But this one 
was one of the few I actually reviewed at the time, and I reviewed it very negatively. Um, so now I can make amends. Um, <laughs> uh, I think what bothered me about it was, I mean, you know, we sort of heard, obviously, reports of it being made, and then there was the whole Morris Levy thing and the record turning up on TV late at night and all of the confusion about the album itself. But, you know, from the first time I heard about the concept of, of John doing an album of old rockers, I thought, wow, what an incredible idea. Because, you know, you think about the way he sang those things with the Beatles. And it was always really, you know, very gutsy performing and, you know, a, a, a real great rock and roll shout. And, uh, you know, the, the kind of stuff that Paul often gets most credit for, you know, but that John did too. I mean, you listen to rock and roll music and, uh, you know, twist and shout, obviously. Um, so I thought, wow, a whole album of that, that's going to be great. When it came out, I think it bothered it. First of all, it sounded really seriously overproduced to me. And I'm not sure whether that was um, because of a change of attitude I was having towards Phil Spector, you know, post Let It Be. Uh, you know, until, until then, Phil Spector was like, you know, the god of the wall of sound and all of his productions were great and all that. And, and Let It Be, not happy with what he did. Uh, and somehow this, although, you know, there was all things must pass, sounded great. Uh, I suppose from today's perspective, you could say it's a little overproduced, but at the time it sounded incredible. This just sounded overproduced. It sounded, you know, there, there were just, uh, you know, too much going on that seemed extraneous to me in the percussion, in various aspects of the arranging. But... You know, and also, you know, something like You Can't Catch Me, I'm also thinking in terms of the originals, you know, and how basically economical the originals were compared with this kind of, from my point of view, overdone version that John and Phil Spector and all of their pals had kind of concocted. But, you know, it wasn't... When did I begin liking this record I, I i'm not sure you know i mean as as time went on you know i'm beginning to listen to these and saying you know i'm 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 kind of uh expecting john to sing the way he sang in the beatles and do the arrangements with the same kind of hard edge that the original artist did but why necessarily should he you know he's doing something right. else here he's doing something interpretive that in a lot of cases, you know, maybe not what I would have chosen if I were him uh, as my interpretation, but it kind of opened up a window into sort of where he was at, you know, which we got to know a bit better when bootlegs of these sessions came out. And we could see that, you know, where he was at was not always the healthiest place. But nevertheless, you know, that he managed to come through those chaotic sessions with an album like this, uh, you know, that I, I listened to it today and, and really enjoyed most of it. So, you know, uh, um, certain of the things, I mean, you know, ain't that a shame? I mean, those and slipping and sliding, you know, partly because of the videos, those always sort of seemed kind of great. And, you know, there are other ones, too. Um, Just Because I thought was a, was a really good performance. I'm not sure specifically what I thought at the time of that one. But uh, Do You Want to Dance? I know that I really didn't like. Uh, Peggy Sue, I thought, you know, was, was a little closer to the spirit of the original, I think, than um, a lot of these others. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it just... It just seemed to, apart from being overproduced, what I thought it was a little undersung in a lot of places. You know, when I'm expecting the John Lennon of, of Twist and Shout and rock and roll music and those first few seconds of Mr. Moonlight that are listenable. Yeah, I think that's what I wanted. And that's not really what this album is. So that's... It's funny you would say it's underproduced. Over. Because, oh, over, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, overproduced because my impression, and I always liked rock and roll, although I didn't hear it from beginning to end. I don't, I don't think I, I didn't own it until after he was killed. 
And that was when I heard it from beginning to end. I always thought it was sloppily slash poorly produced, that it sounded like a train wreck. Yeah. Um, but it was a fun train wreck. You know, I, I liked it because it was John sounded like he was having a ball during those sessions, whether or not he was, especially mm -hmm. with, when Spectre was involved at the beginning. I don't know. But it just came off like a fun session that they didn't bother worrying about the how, how the recording levels were uh, <laughs> in the in the control room. Right. Mm. Yeah. Uh, overall, I, I really love rock and roll, although I wouldn't call it a perfect album. The one song that I have trouble with now is Do You Want to Dance, which I admire John for a different arrangement of the song. But somehow I just don't think it worked with like a reggae feel to it. But, you know, Phil Spector was so well known for the wall of sound that I think it worked for him in the 60s with the records that he did then. And I think for the most part, it worked on this album. And what surprises me most of all is that so many of the songs that Phil Spector worked on were songs that were a much lower arrangement of the original hits. Mm -hmm. I mean, Just Because is the perfect example of that. Sweet Little 16 is slower than the Chuck Berry version. And yet I love it even with that arrangement it works it's something it's something different that was done to the original it didn't have to be the same speed the songs are strong songs regardless of what speed they're in and uh, even like um songs from those sessions like angel baby and to know her is to love her mm -hmm. those are slower and they're powerful because of lennon's vocals too so overall, I think it's a very fun album. You can certainly distinguish the songs that Phil Spector produced from the ones that were just John Lennon produced, right? which were so much more stripped down. Mm -hmm. But definitely, I mean, Stand By Me is, is a classic arrangement of that song. And, and I always love the, the medley of um, Bring It On Home To Me and Send Me Some Love, and that mm -hmm. worked very well together. Mm -hmm. Slipping and Sliding is a killer version. You know, Ain't That a Shame was great. You Can't Catch Me, I had a problem with. That really did go on way too long for me. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I like when there are different arrangements done to these songs. But I think uh, in so many ways, while Phil Spector deserves a lot of credit for the, the production that he's done, in, in so many ways, when it comes to early rock and roll like this, John Lennon's voice is so much what carries the recording. So, um that's kind of how I feel about it. And right. as a radio guy, I bet you, I bet you also appreciate uh, the medley of "Ready, Teddy, and Rip It Up." Nothing like oh, that. Yeah. a half long song, you know, to fill in that uh, when you need that very short track to play <laughs> on mm -hmm. the radio. Definitely, yeah. mm -hmm. I always think of that one. Yeah, you know, when he sang "Old Rockers" with the Beatles, it's not like he adopted the arrangements of the original groups or, or performers like Chuck Berry. I mean, his rock and roll music is very different than Chuck Berry's rock and roll music. So it, it, it wasn't that I wanted it to be exactly like the original performers, but just, you know, like you say, do you want to dance in the reggae thing? Interesting experiment, but I don't think it really, uh, I didn't think it really did the song justice. Um, but, you know, maybe... Maybe there's, uh, you know, a, a different way of looking at the song that, you know, I, I just have never become that comfortable with. Um, but with a few hundred more hearings, maybe maybe I will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Which leaves us with one more album, and that's my pick. And it's the much maligned Driving Rain. Yay. Driving, driving what do you say, Darren? Yay. I've always liked Driving Rain. Oh, good. Good, you'll be on my side because I know Alan doesn't like it. <laughs> Driving Rain is an album that, from the very beginning, I liked, but I always kind of found that it was a batch of good songs that didn't really flow that well together. You know, it's almost like a collection of songs that Paul recorded over a period of time. Let's just throw them all together, see how they stick. And though I liked the songs on the album, they just didn't flow. You know, Paul, I think, has always put a lot of attention into where the songs are placed on on the album. And, um, you know, I like just about all the songs on Driving Rain. And some of them I like so much more now than I did before. And I think one of the problems that I've had with Driving Rain through the years is that um, it's a lot of music to get to know. 
I believe that it's over an hour's worth of music, especially because Rinse the Raindrops is a long jam, which goes on for over 10 minutes. And then they even tack on Freedom as a bonus track. So you have um, basically a lot of songs that I think are really strong, a lot of experimentation on there, a wide variety of styles. And most of the songs I happen to like. I like this album so much more now than I did when it first came out. And I will say that, you know, because I've never looked at any solo Beatle album, pop album. By that, I mean anything but the experimental John and Yoko, Two Virgins type albums or electronic sound. When it comes to pop albums, solo Beatle albums to me go from good to great. I've never considered any solo Beatle album to be truly bad. For an album to be bad, that means half the album or more you don't like. I've never found that to be the case with any of the solo uh, albums. I've never regretted buying any of them. When Driving Rain came out, there were songs I immediately took to. And I thought Lonely Road is such a killer opening track. And one of his best rockers, which worked very well on tour. As Ballads Go, I Do is a very nice song. Um, I've had a problem with From a Lover to a Friend mainly because even though it's a great melody and a great hook, all the la-las in there seem to be Paul at a loss for words trying to fill the gap and not knowing what to put there. So I felt that was kind of awkward in the song, but it's still a great melody, great bass playing on that song too. There's a lot of great bass playing throughout this entire album. She's given up talking, reminds me a lot of Talk More Talk and the more um, electronic experimental stuff on Press to Play. Same thing with Spit It on an Axis, which I love a lot. You know, that's Paul really playing with his voice and just improvising and, and just singing whatever comes off the top of his head. I love the song for that reason. There's all kinds of great tracks on here. Your Love and Flame, I'm not too impressed with that one. There's so many great ballads and love songs that Paul's done throughout his career. For some reason, I don't think he worked that hard on the melody for that one. But um, About You is a terrific rocker, really ballsy one, which uh, really people should discover if they haven't heard it before. Your Way is uh, like one of those, it's not really acoustic, it's electric guitar, I believe, that uh, Paul's doing the finger picking on. It's got a country feel to it that I like a lot. Tiny Bubble is another one in the electronic sound of, uh, of Paul which I like a lot, more of an experimental sound from him. There's so many things going on on this record, and I just like the variety of it all. And, um, yeah, that's about, oh, Heather, despite the fact that it was written about his wife at the time, and we know what happened with their relationship, it's still a beautiful song. <laughs> and I, I love the way that it's arranged for a couple of minutes. You just hear an instrumental bed before you get to uh, the lyrics of the song. I think there's just the one verse, maybe. But it's really a beautiful song. A lot of great tracks all throughout this album. And I think that um, the criticism that it's gotten through the years is not really deserved. I think it's definitely worth more of a spin. You guys want to comment? My opinion of uh, Driving Rain is a little different than yours. Like, to me, the individual songs, I thought, if you just pick the album apart and just listen to one or two of the songs individually. Maybe they're the songs, the, the flaws in the songs come out more. But for me, sticking them all together made a really nice co makes a really nice cohesive listen for me. Huh. Now that could be because uh, just the timing, you know what I mean? At that point in time, driving rain, unfortunately is a nine 11 album came mm -hmm. out on nine 11. 2001 now during that time our lives were all affected and for one reason or another uh and probably because it was the brand new paul mccartney album and i found comfort at a time that we, we all needed it and was looking for it in more ways than one and in different ways i lived with driving rain a lot and played it in the car a lot and heard it from beginning to end and it just was an album for me if I cherry picked a few songs and listened to them individually, they, I, they didn't like it. Didn't work as well for me. Uh, I see the weaknesses in some of the tunes, uh, and I just love the way at the end of the album Paul goes off with Heather, which is one of his great melodies. And now I feel guilty liking because of what it's about. 
But I, Heather's one of my favorite songs by him, period. Mm. Rinse the Raindrops does go on too long, but there's something about just a an, uh, an, uh, semi-out-of-control jam going on for 10 minutes being on a Paul McCartney album that I like. And uh, writing into uh, Jai, Jai Poor, am I got the title right there? Right. I really like that one, too. That was a treat for McCartney to do a song like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, they're flawed songs. Yeah, all right. Rinse the Raindrops really doesn't go anywhere. It has a big guitar solo that's missing that n- never pops up. It's It wants a guitar solo. But it's just maybe because it's just a kind of, I don't know, it just appealed to me. I don't really have a reason. But to me, it's a, it's an album I listen to, and I don't pick the songs apart on that album because I don't think all of them stand well on their own. Hmm. Okay. It's interesting. You and I have a completely different point of view there about the... I, I feel that there is a lack of cohesion on the album. I can see that. But, yeah, I can no. understand that. But, and maybe uh, that's what, appe- what appeals to me. Maybe the lack of cohesion is its cohesion for me. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Or I'm nuts. <laughs> Alan? How about you? What do you think? Well, you know, it's interesting hearing the two of you mention individual songs. There are sort of a lot of them I kind of (laughs) like. And yet my, you know, if you ask me about that album, I would say, yeah, not one of my favorite albums. But, you know, really when, you know, the the songs you've mentioned in most cases, um, there's, there are uh, either I like them or there are aspects of them I like. I mean, you know, I think I agree with uh, Darren's comments about Rinse the Raindrops, but including, you know, when he said, I like the idea of a, a sort of long freeform jam on a Paul McCartney album, even if it isn't going anywhere, you know, um, mm. it, 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 it probably could have gone somewhere. Uh, it probably could have used that guitar solo. And, uh, but nevertheless, I mean, I guess for me, what has colored my experience of driving rain is that when you hit play, the first thing you hear is Paul counting as lyrics. And to me, that just says, I've given up trying to write a line that means something. You know, one, two, three, four, five, let's go for a drive. Give me a break. (laughs) You always point out that line. Yes, it drives me crazy. That's that's one song out of 16 on the album. Right, it's the very first... well, it's not the first it's song. It's the title song. Lonely Road. I mean, it's 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 the title song of the of the the record. It just, um, yeah, I don't know. Well, it, I never had a problem with it because melodically and in terms of like where the chords are going, it's very interesting. The song doesn't go exactly where you expect it to. Yeah. But when we talked about the song, when we talked about this song before, and you brought up the one, two, three, four, five, and then I came back and mentioned all together now. Yeah, Which that's is one. one. Two, three, you can, four, you can do it yeah. once. You can get away oh, with it once. It's almost like saying because, well, Paul did that in the Beatles. So what he did in the Beatles, he can get away with. No, wait a minute. Okay. If his solo career had come before the Beatles, then it would have been the once that he got away with it in, in Driving Rain, maybe. And when, when All Together Now came out, I would still say that's the same thing. It doesn't work. No, I, I think it's... Simple lyrics that work in both cases. Uh, also, the one in All Together Now, it, it sort of comes with a sense of humor. And this just seems like something that, you know, okay, it rhymes with Drive, and that's it. I mean, and especially because you, as you say, that you know there were some interesting chord changes, there were some some interesting music to it. I, I just think another little effort to come up with an actual line, actually two actual lines, because we then go up to ten on the third line. I think I think would have uh, made that made a huge difference in that song, especially for people who like to hear some sort of effort going into things like he lyrics. Goes up to 10. And he doesn't care about lyrics. He has <laughs> said he doesn't care about lyrics. So, okay. Well, that's, that's not entirely true. There are times when he puts a lot of effort in his lyrics. There are times when he doesn't. Yes, that's I, true. I, that's and, true. But he has said generally. Now, mm. Altogether. Now he goes up to 10. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I, it's just, um, you know, I, I like the song Driving Rain. I like where it's going melodically. I just like where the song's going. Overall, I feel like it's a complete song. And it's very easy to pick on that line. There's other lines from McCartney lyrics through the years that we can pick on. Oh, yeah. If you want to. But I just don't see... It, it's not that big a deal. One, two, three, four, five, let's go for a drive. Before the two of you end up in a fistfight, um, <laughs> I, I know what Alan's saying. I don't feel that way for the song Driving Rain. There's other McCartney songs I feel that. And some of the tunes on Egypt Station, I felt, were l- very lyrically weak. Or lyrically very weak. And that he could tr- could have tried more with the... This, some of the songs on Egypt Station because there's not much substance there lyrically. Uh, I don't feel that way about Driving Rain. I just think it worked as a catchy hook, uh, a lyric in a, in a song. Uh, but it's something that has bothered me on, on on more than one occasion with McCartney's lyric writing. Yeah. You know, I, I understand what you're saying, Darren. I don't have a problem with the lyrics here for Driving Rain. A song like, here's one that really bothers me. <laughs> Feet in the Clouds, okay, from Memory Almost Full. Mm -hmm. At one point he sings, it's getting very, 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 very hard. Okay. Yep, I agree with you. (laughs) Now, there's one moment when he could have worked on the lyrics. That's where it just, that there was no effort put there. Yeah. But, you know, one, two, three, four, five, let's go for a drive does work. Well, what, what do you say. mean it works? It it rhymes, that's true, but w- works in what sense? What does it tell you about anything at all on the planet? <laughs> Just the fact that it does rhyme, and, you know, I could I could enjoy it for that reason. Well, so does Eeny Beeny Miny Mo catch a tiger by the toe? But if you put that in a song, you'd say, come on, Paul, you know. Actually, isn't that in a Frank Zappa song? I'm sorry. <laughs> Frank Zappa maybe could do it, you know. <laughs> You'd know he was being sarcastic. <laughs> I don't know where else to go with, with that. But yeah, um, yeah. it's not the greatest lyrics in the world. But to me, it, it's fine. It doesn't offend me. It's not offensive. There you go. There you go. Not offensive. <laughs> <laughs> you could definitely say that. <laughs> All right, so I think that uh, that puts to wrap on our uh, review of solo albums that we appreciate more now. And uh, so why don't we give the folks our contact information? And we'll start with you, Darren. Um, you can uh, send me an email at darrendevivo at wfuv.org. Obviously, that's my WFUV email address. And the name is spelled D A R R E N D E V. I V O. Uh, go to my Facebook, my radio Facebook page, Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. Some of you I know have sent me friend requests at Darren DeVivo. Send it to uh, uh, send, send a, a click like on the radio page, which is Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio, as opposed to just Darren DeVivo. If you don't mind, thank you very much. All right, Alan, and you. Okay, the best way to get to me is on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Alan Cozen Remixed tends to be more of my the Beatles side of my life, and uh, regular Alan Cozen is more of my classical stuff. But um, either way is fine, and uh, there you go. All right. As for me, uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. With the uh, coming release of uh, Above Us Only Sky, the John and Yoko documentary, um, I do happen to have interviews with four people that were involved with that documentary, including Michael Epstein, the director for the film, who also worked on Lennon NYC. There's Elliot Mintz. There's Dan Richter, who is John and Yoko's personal assistant, and Jack Douglas. And they're all there on my interviews, page four, page of my website. So as this is coming out in preparation for it, (laughs) or if you want more information from people who are involved in uh, the documentary, check out the website as well as my weekly Beatles trivia, where you can win one of nine great prizes every single week. 
Again, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Did we give out our email address, Alan? We did not. If you want to email any of us at the show, uh, send it to things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. That's one word, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Um, and one or all or any of us uh, may respond. Um, otherwise, you know, sometimes people propose uh ideas for us and uh, that's always interesting and uh but we just we love reading your comments uh you can also follow us on twitter at uh at sign things we said fab and we have a facebook page things we said today beatles radio fans and there are ideas for uh topics that we've been sent that we are strongly considering here on the show. So uh, by all means, please do write to us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. All right. So this has been great talking about albums from the solo Beatles that we appreciate for it now. And thanks so much for tuning in for Alan Cozen and Darren DeVivo. I'm Ken Michael saying thanks for listening and we will see you next time.